There we go. All right, we're back from break. Uh, next on our agenda is the uh, special presentation um, recognizing the outgoing board and commission members. I have um, eight different plaques to give out, and what I understand is there's four people that are not available to receive their plaque, but we'll re read their names anyways. Uh, it's uh, Lynn Asman, and she was on the Arts and Festivals uh, Committee. Uh, Kelly Muller, and she was also on the Arts and Festivals Committee. Meryl Charles, is, uh, who was on the Parks and Recreation Board, and then Sarah Marie Borner, who was on the Library Board. The ones that we are, are that we think are going to be here are Jennifer Keene, who is the chair of the Arts and Festivals Committee. Go ahead, come on up. Thank you for your service. Thank you. I appreciate it. Do you want to say anything? Oh. You're good. You're done. You're done with the microphone. I understand. Uh, next is Eric Clark, Planning Commission. See here. Nope. Uh, Claudia Elsmore, who is on the Landmark Preservation Board. Didn't see Claudia. And the last is Katie Loveless, who is on the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee. Not here. All right. We have one out of eight. That's good. Thank you for coming, Jennifer. <laughs> I'll go back to the podium. Okay, so next on the agenda is the uh, council committee reports and the city manager report. Is there any council committee reports? Deputy Mayor? Um, I have one, but I have to open my computer. So if Rosemary's ready, she can go. Councilmember McCall, go ahead. Um, thank you. So um, I did want to just report on the celebration of the opening of Main Street because it was such a special day for all of us. And um, Mayor, uh, you did a great job in your presentation. We also really need to recognize the police and the firemen who came and had many things happening for the young people to be able to sit in there, touch the fire truck and sit in the police cars. And it was just really, really well, well done. And I guess I should also say that the merchants of Main Street really showed up and opened their doors and welcomed people. So um, it was a amazing day and I want to thank Tori and Barbara and Catherine as well for your work in making sure that people knew about it and and that people had a great time so I want to just recognize that and thank you all and the red ribbon is now in the hands of Tori because as a memorial <laughs> for the celebration of the day so for historic purposes Awesome, thank you. Uh, next is Deputy Mayor. I just have one report. Um, the first meeting of the Sound Transit 405 Bus Rapid Transit elected leadership group ended after that phrase because it's so long. No, just joking. Um, so the, the basically this was our first meeting, I think, of four. Um, Sound Transit um, kind of gave a, a brief overview of the 405 um, Bus Rapid Transit project and the, the timelines and whatnot. Um, my takeaways were that Sound Transit said to everyone that they're looking to locate a bus storage and maintenance facility in Canyon Park. Um, and to which my response was, well, I hope you're planning on a direct access ramp because the traffic is really congested up there and um, it's currently lacking from the plan, um, at least as I knew it. Uh, I later learned, about, I'm talking to WashDOT, that the legislature had put in 15 million towards phases 1A and 1B. Um, and 1B does uh, include a direct access ramp. Um, I had previously thought it was for right of way and um, apparently it's not, it's for 1B. So 1B would include a direct access ramp um, and express toll lanes in the northbound direction of the 522 interchange. Um, so that's all I have to report from that meeting. Councilmember Olson. Just quick little report on the Snohomish Health District. Uh, so we are, the health the district is providing syringe pickup cleanup kits at the police department. So it has a, syringe sharp container, tongs, uh, gloves, uh, and 
Um, so if people wish to go over to the police department, pick them up, clean up parks or wherever that they encounter syringes, they are available over there. Awesome, thank you. Council Member Zorns, are you good over there? Do you have a committee report? Oh, nope, okay. All right, moving on. Uh, oh wait, City Manager, did you have a report? Nope, okay. Uh, moving on to the visitor comment. And just so everybody that's here is aware, we do have a public hearing later. And so if you want to, you can speak now if you'd like, or you can wait till the public hearing to speak to, about the uh, housing strategy update and work program. So uh, for a visitor comment, I always read this. Not that. That would have been bad. Uh, each person addressing the council will give his or her name in an audible tone of voice for the record, and unless the council grants further time, shall limit the address to three minutes. No person other than the council and the person having the floor will be permitted to enter into any discussion either directly or through a member of the council without the permission of the mayor. And I have no sign-up sheets. Does anybody want to provide public comment tonight? Go ahead and come up to the podium, give your name for the record. Pat Pierce, do you need my address? I wasn't paying attention. Okay. I'm here to talk about the uh, housing strategy, particularly the strategy work program. Um, but in starting with a housing strategy, it's caused a bit of confusion the way it's presented. It, it, it's kind of morphing into the plan, but it's sitting on hold or something. It's, it's not really clear about how this is being implemented. Are we going to have a strategy that is part of going forward? Because when you read the agenda bill, it's, it's a little muddy. And normally there'd be a resolution or an ordinance attached and, and that's not there. So that caused some confusion with some people that, that called me up saying, what on earth is going on kind of attitude. So I just wanted to, to pass that on. But my particular concern has to do with the housing strategy work program and it seems to all, except for the, the ADU, focused on the downtown area. And it seems to me if we do have a functioning plan for affordable housing, a housing strategy plan, we would be looking citywide. We wouldn't be focused down here at the navel of the universe. And those of us that live here are kind of what you might call PTSD kind of, we're, we're tired. We've had it. Uh, you know, we've been living with upheaval. It's hard to get around. You, you don't know if you can walk away. You know, you don't know if you can drive down. It's, it's, that fatigue has kind of taken over. And so the other problem is when talking about number one and number two, those have been issues that those neighborhoods worked on very hard, particularly during the downtown plan and then subsequently from when other issues have come up. Um, and there were some changes made at the end when the downtown plan was talk, being talked about, oops, and, and changes were made by council to reflect what the uh, neighborhoods were saying. And then there was another plan over here on 185th where uh, we reached a compromise. So the density and heights would go on the 185th side of the alley and then the neighborhoods wouldn't be affected. So if you would please just take those off and look citywide and not kind of disrupt what's already been done and, and disrupt promises made. So, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I saw another hand come up and just, just your name. We don't need your address. Uh, my name's Mike Robinson, and I'm here to support what Pat was talking about. I, I don't know too much about the specifics of the latest threats that I call it to the neighborhood. Historically, I've been here over four decades and been through a lot of changes, and Pat alluded to some of the deals that were sort of made along the way. And in the mid-80s, it's when the neighborhood woke up that things were happening around and there wasn't anybody that was real tied into it until we had a pocket of high density and we had single family where we bought our home at the corner of 186 and 101st nearby and it was very residential. Across the street it was high density anyway. 
All this led to kind of a showdown in the mid 80s because the developers wanted to do something, the residents wanted to do something, and there was this mix mash of zoning. So at an extension of several months and many meetings and much planning commission and compromise and things, the area that we lived in went from single family to low density. The low density areas moved into the medium and the high density, the deal was, and you can see it happening up there now, was that you could put a good sized building there, but you needed to have enough property to be able to provide from overcrowding everybody around and it would come together in a pattern. And my gosh, if you guys know the neighborhood at all, you know what I'm talking about. It's happened up there since this time. The people that were there and chose to stay have continued to stay. Some have rebuilt with new homes because the stuff that's come in is doing exactly what the plan hoped it would do then. It would incorporate the new to address the rundown aspects of the neighborhood and yet invite development that fit. And now we have both. We have some high scale housing in our neighborhood and we have some affordable housing in our neighborhood, which is very timely in what we're talking about. As far as any more crowding into that area, what we've got now, might as well just go ahead and get it over with or draw the line now and do what we need to do in the areas where there isn't all of the threat to a pretty good established part of old bottle. Something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wants to provide public comment? Seeing none, we'll go into the next item, which is the consent agenda. Nothing's been pulled. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. It's moved by the deputy mayor, seconded by council member Agnew. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, go ahead and place your vote. All right, passes unanimously. We're, uh, like I said in the beginning, we, I moved the old business to after we do the public hearing. So um, we're now on to AB 18-070, which is the housing strategy update and work program. I'm officially opening the public hearing. Uh, we have uh, first a staff presentation from Senior Planner David Boyd. So Mr. Boyd is getting the uh, presentation up. If I could just make a few uh, remarks, Mayor and uh, members of the council, just want to set the stage for what, uh, what the purpose is of tonight's uh, public hearing and what we're asking from the council this evening. Uh, so we have a public hearing and we are asking for council action after the public hearing on two items. Uh, Mr. Boyd will walk you through that. This is really a recap um, and Dave, if you could go to the, there we go, to the second slide. This is really a recap of the housing strategy update. You received a briefing back on March 13th. Uh, so we're going to do a quick recap of that, highlight the edits that uh, have been made so far just based on the feedback that we've received to date, uh, review a proposed work program to implement the strategy, and, and that is really based on the, uh, the Tier 1 recommendations from the Planning Commission and the feedback that we received from the City Council at the March 13th meeting. So what we have done with that work program has really gone into more detail. Uh, we're coming to you with that so that you can give us some direction as to which of those you would like us to work on. So this is really just taking the implementation strategy a step further before we spend time doing some additional work on uh, potential implementation strategies that the council may or may not want to continue with. So uh, after the public testimony, we're really asking for the council action. Uh, there are three possibilities. We're uh, asking for action on the strategy itself as well as the work program in two separate items. So the uh, council could approve the strategy and the work program uh, as recommended in the packet by staff. You could modify those uh, prior to your approval this evening, or you could give us some direction as to some things that you would like some more information on or some reworking, um, but that's what we're asking for from the council this evening. So Mr. Boyd will walk you through the, the report um, and answer any questions. We also have Arthur Sullivan and Mike Stanger from Arch here to help us this evening and answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, uh, Planning Commission Chair uh, David Vliet who, who's here and <clears throat> available to answer questions if, if needed. <clears throat> so uh, just 
to uh, um, give a quick recap of, of where we are in this process, um, last on March uh, 13th, we uh, presented the planning recommendation on the housing strategy. Uh, tonight, we're moving one step further. We've taken uh, that strategy and those top tier, uh, the top tier strategies, together with your feedback, as Mike said, uh, to do a more detailed work program. So that work program. Uh, uh, did not go through uh, planning commission review. That's that's something that we've distilled from what they did and what you've uh, you uh, uh, voiced uh, in your concerns and comments on on March 13th. The work program includes items that would go back to planning commission for that more detailed review before it comes back to council for uh, a recommendation. So, uh, if if uh, council moves forward with the with the work program as as recommended. So again, uh, the, we're, we got here through a series of uh, focus groups, uh, public hearings, uh, panel discussion of uh, housing experts uh, that all went into uh, Planning Commission's uh, nine month plus uh, uh, consideration of this important topic. That resulted in their recommended housing strategy update, uh, which uh, went to, to council uh, at the study session on March 13th. And then tonight, we're coming back with this more detailed uh, work program uh, for the next five years. Um, so the, in the blue here are, are the items that were in the uh, uh, presentation uh, on, on the 13th. Uh, tonight's packet includes uh, some minor updates to the Planning Commission recommendation. Uh, and a more detailed work program uh, for, the, for the next five years. The updates uh, to the Planning Commission recommendation, like I said, are quite minor. In Appendix B, uh, there were a few dates in there that uh, um, uh, have, have been updated uh, just since Planning Commission started the work on that. Uh, there have been some progress on some of these items, uh, including um, <clears throat> the downtown development figures, uh, and uh, the adoption of the campus master plan and a clustering PUD, which were both identified as in progress and then are now, have now been adopted. Um, <clears throat> it also includes updates to uh, Appendix G, the housing strategy matrix, to reflect uh, Council's removal of the South Riverside rezone in the uh, 2018 docket. And that's, uh, those are on uh, pages 108 and 109 of your packet. The feedback we got on March 13th, uh, we heard strong support from Council for the city doing more to address uh, affordable housing. We heard strong support for transit-oriented development. Uh, I think a majority of Council included that in their comments. And, and transit-oriented development uh, probably means a lot of things to a lot of people, but it really means in the basic core is directing housing to areas with transit service, uh, like downtown. Uh, and making improvements to walkability and livability in transit and employment hubs like Canyon Park. So that's where we are focusing uh, uh, much of our effort initially uh, through the proposed downtown code amendments and through the ongoing work uh, in Canyon Mar Park to develop a, uh, a new sub area plan uh, in Canyon Park. Uh, there's, we also heard support for partnering with other institutions, uh, including faith communities, and for encouraging uh, accessory dwelling units, or ADUs. Um, we also we heard questions about Bothell's demographics and housing needs. Uh, those uh, are were included in uh, are and are included in Appendix C of the um, of the housing strategy, and uh, that starts on page 95 of your packet. And I've included that first page here, which includes a couple of uh, interesting uh, uh, pieces of the demographic uh, pie, including the fact that uh, half of all Bothell jobs pay less than $50,000 a year. So that demonstrates that there, there is certainly a need for uh, a housing for that sector of the population. As you'll see in the bar charts uh, in the lower left here also that Bothell does have a lower percentage of the lowest income level and a higher percentage of the uh, uh, middle income and above, uh, but we still have a, a sizable uh, portion, uh, over 50%, uh, that do earn less than $50,000 a year. And that includes 
people like teachers and medical assistants, retail clerks, dental assistants, customer service representatives. Uh, so those are, are people that uh, the Planning Commission recognized needed to be addressed. The, uh, a, a gap, this uh, chart illustrates uh, one of the gaps that we have in our housing. Countywide, uh, there's uh, the, the, 12% of the population is in that lowest uh, uh, income bracket uh, where 30% uh, of the area meeting in income. Bothell provides housing uh, suitable for just 2% of that, of, of our total uh, uh, housing uh, supply. So we do have a, a sizable gap there. Uh, King County wide, uh, they're a little closer. They're, they've got twice as much as, as Bothell, but still uh, a, a substantial gap. So that's just one, one part of the, the need equation. This is a slide from the study session that has a number of, uh, of uh, other uh, aspects of the need equation. I'm not going to go into all of this, but it does touch on the demographics uh, of Bothell. Uh, it uh, shows that there's a, a, a large number of the uh, lowest and, and, and low income uh, uh, homeowners are, and renters are severely cost burdened that uh, they need to spend more than half of their income on housing. Uh, it shows that there's a sizable population, Bothell, 85% of the folks that work in Bothell uh, commute from elsewhere uh, and some percent of that, that's just by choice or other circumstances, but a certain percent of that is that they, they're just not finding a, a affordable or suitable housing in Bothell. And then, yes, we do have a homeless population. Uh, North Shore School District reported that in 2015-2016 they had uh, uh, 203 homeless kids. That was a bit of an eye-opener in our uh, discussions with Planning Commission. Uh, and there are more entering that, uh, that uh, the homeless system uh, every year. Uh, back to cost burden households in, in uh, Bothell, um, only 10% of the low or very low income rent rentals uh, have housing that they can afford. 60% uh, or more are severely uh, cost burdened. Um, that's shown in the, the first two columns of the chart here. Uh, of the moderate income renters, uh, almost twice as, as many are um, likely to be cost burdened than the middle income uh, earners uh, in the renters in the uh, in the fourth column here. Um, this also uh, not on the chart, uh, but uh, uh, the analysis shows that uh, both moderate and higher income seniors uh, in Bothell are uh, tend to be severely cost burdened, and uh, and that uh, a number of uh, about a third of moderate or home, uh, lower income homeowners are severely cost burdened. Um, And this is probably no surprise to anyone, but uh, the uh, affordable or the rents are going up quickly. And for the first time in, in uh, 2018, this goes through 2017, but in 2018, uh, average rents exceed the affordability level for moderate income housing, uh, or ha moderate income households, those are earning 80% uh, of median income. And on the home ownership side, uh, again, uh, the um, uh, costs are, are uh, outpacing uh, the uh, income levels, as shown in this chart, showing both single family and condo uh, prices compared to the uh, median, what's affordable at a median income. So that sort of concludes a brief uh, recap of some of housing, Bothell's housing needs. Uh, next, the, the real meat of tonight's uh, discussion is on the housing strategy work program. And as, as I said, this is, was derived from those tier one strategies in the Planning Commission's recommendation and uh, addresses the feedback we got from Council on uh, the need to address affordable housing and uh, and to focus on TU, TODs uh, as two particular areas. It's a five-year plan, and the, uh, but the focus really is on the 2018 tasks, which are highlighted. And um, most of these items will require further analysis, and any plan and code amendments that are included in this 
uh, work program will go to planning commission and come back to council uh, for action. So all we're asking for tonight is for uh, initiation of those those new items that weren't included in the 2018 docket. It also includes items from other departments work programs, uh, things that they will be doing anyway, but that do help uh, reinforce housing uh, in, in the city of Bothell. We've highlighted uh, in the staff report three potential code amendments that were not included in the docket. Uh, and then uh, it, we've also given some additional analysis to one potential downtown rezone that was in the docket, but that could inf uh, include an affordable housing requirement. So those three, uh, those, those are uh, removing some or all of the general downtown corridor three-story overlay along with a, an affordable housing requirement, removing some or all of the remaining downtown transition district density limit with an affordability requirement, um, and one that's not downtown focused, uh, potential amendments to allow carriage houses and, uh, uh, and to remove other impediments to accessory dwelling units that have uh, arisen, um, uh, especially carriage houses o units over garages uh, is one that has brought this one to the forefront. And then uh, there is additional, like I said, additional de detail uh, and analysis of the uh, GC to SR 522 uh, rezone uh, uh, along the west side of 522 south of Ormbrek. So the general downtown corridor three-story overlay would revert to the four-story and 45-foot height limit that was originally proposed and studied in the planned action EIS. All of these uh, potential code amendments are, are what we consider the, the uh, low-hanging fruit, the, the, uh, the potential for creating some affordable housing within the downtown sub area and within the what was studied in the EIS that wouldn't require going back for a supplemental EIS. So the EIS did study uh, uh, this entire area as, a, as four stories and 45 feet uh, and by lifting that height limit, we would create the nexus for an affordable housing requirement. Uh, it's also uh, uh, reflecting that the campus recently, the campus master plan that was recently approved, allows 65 foot heights on their Beardsley frontage where Husky Village is. Uh, so this would uh, more closely reflect those, those heights. Uh, downtown transition uh, density limit is one that uh, Planning Commission did recommend uh, removing entirely. Uh, council chose uh, to, to selectively remove that. So the remaining areas are the ones that are shown with the white cross hatching uh, along Lower Maywood and uh, West Hill. Uh, and again, uh, there would still, as in the uh, general downtown corridor, there was, would still be special setback and height limits that would protect the adjacent single family areas. Um, and uh, the density would be limited by height setbacks and parking. Uh, this would again provide an access for affordable housing requirements. The other uh, item that uh, would, needs to be initiated uh, and would be initiated if you accept the the work program uh, are uh, potential amendments to uh, remove impediments to accessory dwelling units, including carriage house units. And the illustration here shows uh, a garage on an alley in the lower Maywood area, which uh, outside the downtown sub area, but nearby that uh, uh, where the proponent uh, proposes to add a, a level onto an existing garage uh, for an accessory unit, but uh, the current regulations prevent that. They allow garages in rear yards, but not uh, accessory units. Also, the height limit uh, um, does provide some real challenges uh, for getting a, a second, a two-level structure in. And this is all, when, when we've talked about accessory units, we often show uh, carriage house units as a as a an attractive way to do them, uh, but our code currently makes it very difficult. And then uh, initiated in the 2018 planning docket uh, is the rezone from General Commercial to SR 522 south of Ormbreck Street, the green area on the map here. Um, property owners in this area have uh, submitted comments that, that were presented to council. Uh, during the docketing uh, 
process, uh, that redevelopment options were limited by the GC zone, zoning. Uh, and again, this would uh, allow housing in this area and uh, provide that at nexus for affordable housing requirements. Uh, beyond those er those uh, items, um, there uh, are opportunities that are identified in the work program for studying uh, the potential for affordable housing uh, pr provisions on the sale of the remaining downtown parcels that are shown in yellow here. And then outside of downtown, uh, the Canyon Park Regional Growth Center provides opportunities for, for transit-oriented uh, development. And that's um, illustrated here. The areas in the pink outline are areas where we've, that we've identified through the visioning process in Canyon Park as having the best potential for mixed use development and adding some uh, housing density, uh, housing um, uh, uh, within the Canyon Park uh, uh, Regional Growth, at, Growth Center. And those will be uh, studied further as we move uh, beyond the visioning phase and into actual studying uh, code amendments and working with the stakeholders, including the uh, owners association, uh, to figure out how to how they can lift their uh, covenants restricting housing in a way that uh, will provide the the result that uh, that we would like to see there. So with that, um, I open it up for questions from staff. Uh, then. Uh, move on to public testimony, council deliberations, and uh, motions and votes to approve separately the housing strategy, up, strategy update and the work program, including the initiation of the new code amendments. Thank you. Did you want to have Arthur talk first, or did you want, you're just here for backup near the bench? All right, good to see you. Questions for staff? Oh, wait. We did, do you guys want to take public comment first? Usually we do that. I have, is there a sign-up sheet for the public hearing? Nobody's on it? Okay. Would anybody like to provide public comment during the public hearing? Go ahead, come up and give your name for the record. Same rules apply as the uh, public comment period. Hi, my name is uh, Eric McIntyre, and the plans you're looking at for the carriage house are actually my plans. Uh, me and my wife live right up the street. We have a historic home. <clears throat> and we wanted to add a small ADU to the rear of our property for an apartment for our son, who currently um, just finished two years at Cascadia. He's starting uh, UW next month, or uh, next year. Um, we've been, all of us, our whole family has been heavily involved in the, the city of Bothell. Uh, my wife was on the preservation board. I've been coaching for the minor leagues in the football league, the junior leagues for the last seven years. So we're very invested in the city of Bothell. Uh, my son, uh, two of my sons work down at the, uh, at the ranch and my son that's currently going, that's gonna be going to UW, he looked around for some place to stay around here. And there's no place that somebody who works at the ranch and goes full time to college can really afford um, the, the Husky, uh, the apartments over there by the college campus are about $1,200 a month. Um, across the street from our house, there's a, a fourplex that is th 329 square feet each fourplex. That's $800. So we asked to build this ADU, and everything we've tried, we've been, uh, there's been a roadblock because of the current. Um, rules and regulations in place. And really the only <clears throat> recourse we have now is um, because where our garage is built, we could tear it down and move it back six feet, or we can hope that you guys would look at some of the regulations and, and kind of identify some changes that can be made so we can provide affordable housing for our children while they're in college. That's what this is about. It's, it's we just want to, <clears throat> you know, have some of our children have some independence on their own while not being buried in debt so they can still live in Bothell. And so I hope you really look at all the regulations that are really hindering development of, of ADUs in this area and, and you know, <clears throat> help 
help the home the homeowners in this area be able to provide you know some some living quarters for you know other people that may need help that's fine thank you thank you is there anybody else that wants to provide public comment seeing none we'll move into council questions of staff questions you guys are speechless that's awesome all right is there a motion to approve okay no, there we go <laughs> deputy mayor i was trying not to be first again <laughs> oh where do i start um so in regards to page 77 the the code amendment uh recommendations are possible changes, potential, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, I was curious, um, what does it mean when it says in the second paragraph under item one, um, it says height adja heights adjacent to residential are limited to three stories and 35 feet. So we would be approving four stories, so how does that play into three stories and 35 feet? Is the 35 feet a setback or is it a step back? It, it basically amounts to an upper level setback. So uh, at the back property line, the property line adjacent to a single family neighborhood, uh, the height would be 35 feet. Uh, and that would have to continue for uh, 65 feet before the the project go, go up to a four stories. So it would so. be six, say, so 65 feet from the front of the building or from the from the face, side. the face that's next to a, a residential, correct, building. Okay. Um, my next question is um, in regards to the the carriage house. Do um, are there regulations uh, in place, or would there be regulations in place if we approve this, so that it wasn't able to I guess I'm a, just a little concerned about, um, I like the idea, the concept, but just trying to play devil's advocate, do, would there be any concern about blocking neighbors' views and that sort of thing? Or are there allowances for that sort of thing to? Well, the current height limit is 20 feet or the height of the primary structure, whichever is less. Mm -hmm. uh, that is pretty restrictive uh, when it comes to adding a second level, uh, either on top of a garage or just a two-story two uh, ADU. Um, and other jurisdictions uh, use 28 feet, 25 feet that, that would um, make that easier. So, so we would be looking to, to modify that sort of the minimum possible uh, because the idea of, uh, with these ADUs is they are they're size limited. They're li they can only be a maximum of 800 square feet. Um, this one is proposed it would be quite a bit less than that. And uh, so they are supposed to fit into the, the neighborhood and they do require that uh, one of the residences be owner occupied. So um, we don't, you know, we haven't worked through all those details. Okay. Uh, this would go back to planning commission and I think they did a very thoughtful job and and, a, and were fairly conservative in their approach last time around. We're finding that uh, some of those restrictions are, are um, uh, getting in the way of uh, some projects that we think would would be worth uh, approved that deserve to be approved. Okay. Um, in regards to the housing st strategy plan, um, on page eighty five, it talks about. Uh, affordable housing with capacity increases. Um, and I guess my question is, um, so everybody has in their packet this this thing, Introduction to Affordable Housing. It came from a sit down that I had with um, a gentleman who was on actually the, the uh, task force on Bellevue. And so he sat down with me and, and um, I wanted to share with you what I learned because I thought it was um, a nice add-on um, to what we've already discussed. And, and in that we had a discussion about inclusionary zoning. And so um, as he explained it to me, and, and I wanna make sure that we're on the same page, the inclusionary zoning is when you mandate a percentage of affordable housing or and or 
if, if it's not included, um, the developer has to pay into a fund. And so I guess what I was wondering is, we didn't use those words in this plan, but is that what we're thinking we'll be doing? Because according to this gentleman, Hal from Spectrum, um, and, and I took an affordable housing tour and, and pretty much every source that I've talked to um, says that if you want affordable housing, you have to mandate it. And so I'm just curious how, how that plays in with what we're suggesting here. Does that make sense, my question? I'll, I'll take a start at and I think Arthur can uh, uh, elaborate on that. So inclusionary zoning uh, includes a range of different strategies, including uh, mandatory requirements as well as incentives. Uh, what we're, and so we're starting down the path of, of, of inclusionary uh, zoning with the uh, affordable housing requirements when we do increase capacity, uh, but there are there are a number of other strategies that we could use, and and, and I'll defer to to Arthur to to uh, elaborate on that. Uh, but one of the first what, one thing we haven't focused on here tonight is uh, Planning Commission already has made uh, recommendations for the foundational uh, code amendments to allow us to apply. Uh, these affordable housing requirements when we increase capacity and that's one of the first things we'll be bringing back to council It doesn't have to go back to Planning Commission. They've already uh, done it and and then that can be expanded to include other uh, inclusionary uh, uh, Housing policies. I guess I was trying to um, understand how that would apply in particular to these code amendment potentials um, and Right. That makes sense. So we've worked with about eight cities in East King County on this program. We're at this point, we're not saying if it's going to be mandatory or voluntary. I'm not necessarily disagreeing with the comment you're making, but what we want to first start with is basic principles. And then when you look at any individual rezone, be it a site or a neighborhood, that will be one of the things talked about first by the commission and then by you. And so in many of the cities we've worked with, they've landed in a spot where it is a mandatory provision. There have been some cases where the cities have made it technically uh, voluntary, but they started with a really low base FA, you know, really low capacity. And if you wanted to go higher, then you, then you had to provide the affordable. So there's a couple different ways it can be done. Um, and it'll be your call and the commission's call and the commission and then your call ultimately if you want it to be a straight mandatory approach or an approach that links it to some additional capacity. We even have one city who did both in one neighborhood. They have a mandatory component, and then if you go above a baseline, then you add a voluntary component on top of that. So we like to go into those things so that you can look at each neighborhood. We know there's two or three approaches. Look at those two or three approaches and see what feels best in that circumstance. But in many times, it does land on a mandatory approach. Okay. And if I could just elaborate a little bit on what Arthur has talked about. So when we talk about the mandatory, um, and we've talked about an increase in the capacity, in order for us to require a, uh, a certain amount of affordable housing, we have to provide some additional capacity for the developer. We can't just outright require it. There has to be a quid pro quo, if you will. Uh, so there has to be a benefit to them that comes through that increased capacity. So that's an important part to consider here. That yes. often is the, is the case with an, an incentive program as well. Uh, but as you stated, typically, um, in, at least in the research that we had done before, we're, we're more likely to get more units out of a mandatory program than an incentive program. The other piece I want to add to this, and this is, we'll be working with, uh, with Arthur if you approve the work program tonight and these particular aspects of it, but we'll be working with Arthur and his staff at ARCH to determine just how much of an increase would be necessary in order to make that mandatory provision work. And that varies by market, so we're not sure exactly how much of an increase we'd be talking about at this point. That's a lot of the additional analysis that we would have to do. Right. Okay. So, so to illustrate that point, some cities have wanted to get the affordability level at a lower level, like at 50 or 60 or 70% of median. 
you need to generally give a bigger bonus. You know, there's usually some type of ratio when you're doing that math. And some cities have actually combined two different strategies together. They've taken a density increase with a multifamily tax exemption and combined those together to get greater affordability. So that's what I mean by we know the various tools that can be used and we'll explore, we'll help you explore those in each individual case and you can figure out what makes sense within what we think are the legal bounds that you have. Yes, and um, I, that's why I asked the question because on the, the packet, the last page, it, it compares just using one, um, you don't have the benefit of the packet, but oh, I've seen it, yeah. Um, yeah. but it, it compares getting 15 if you're just using on inclusionary zoning and then as much as 58 if you have multiple uh, incentives and right. whatnot. So that was important right. to me. Um, okay, okay. Uh, I have, <laughs> sorry, I have a bunch of questions. Um, on Under the timely strategies, this is just, I, I wasn't understanding why some are highlighted in blue. I was trying to figure out what does that mean? Are those the ones that are most timely? I just was not clear. No, uh, that's, uh, that was a, just a graphic tool to, to distinguish the different strategies. So it, it alternates between the white So it's just for and the blue readability? Ones. Yeah. Okay. And, and it was designed, uh, the idea there, Planning Commission thought it would be useful to have a like a one page or a double sided uh, handout that we could uh, give folks that would uh, tell tell them what what those timely uh, top tier strategies were, and uh, so that that's a first uh, stab at that. Uh, we'll, we'll we can develop that as we if that's a if a handout like that is something that we uh, pursue. Okay, uh, yeah. no problem. I just I'd want to make sure I wasn't missing something. Um, a general comment on the strategy matrix is that we there aren't a lot that address lower, very low um, income, and so um, it's just it, obviously those are the most needy um, in, in terms of category, and when we don't really have a lot to address that, so um, you don't have to respond right now. It's just a general comment. Um, I could. One thing that might help, uh, the inclusionary zoning uh, techniques uh, where we're getting developers to build uh, the affordable units, um, and Arthur, please <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they're generally more targeted at the uh, moderate uh, inc income levels, 50% uh, to 80%. Uh, to get at the 50% and lower, uh, those uh, generally re require some sort of public involvement, um, uh, either uh, um, using those surplus properties might be one way, uh, collecting um, fees in lieu of uh, providing, and then uh, working with uh, uh, low uh, affordable housing developers to provide that. Uh, those are some techniques that will get you to those lower levels. Okay. So that, th those are those are things that we will be looking at uh, further as we develop this. So I guess a process question would be: um, after tonight, whatever we pr approve or don't approve, it it all ha uh, uh, any up zones aren't going to actually happen until the end of the year because they're code amendments. So we have time to get our affordable housing strategies in place. In other words, it'll, the affordable housing, well, some, yeah. not all, some of those affordable housing strategies will be um, at the same time as the up zones. Well, I guess what we're, I guess the way we're looking at it is we're approving the strategy uh, tonight. We hope we're approving the strategy tonight. Uh, and then within that work program, we will be developing those strategies as we work on and, and it's not just uh, up zones, it's also code amendments that, um, that might increase the capacity, uh, can provide that nexus or that quid pro quo to, uh, to require or incentivize uh, affordable units. Okay. So, so it is a work in progress, but uh, this is uh, setting the stage for the next five years uh, and particularly for the next year. We anticipate that we would come back to you each year with 
that coming year's uh, de more detailed work program. The deputy mayor raises a good point. So in terms of the timing, though, we would have to put the mandatory requirement in with or ahead of an up zone or any increase in density. We can't do it retroactively. Okay, thank you. Um, so those are my questions. I do have comments. Should I wait? Okay. All right, any other questions of staff? Councilmember McAuliffe. Thank you. So there's three areas I'm really concerned about. and. Um, the first one would be the ADU regulations, and I know we had a member from the audience speak about the difficulty they, they had in trying to build an ADU for their son. One of my philosophies is, is that in order for our children sometime to stay uh, at home or in Bothell is that we need to be able to build a cottage. So could you, not at this point in time, but give me some of the uh, input you've received on the difficulties of building ADUs. Because I know you can do the above the garage one, I saw that, but a separate dwelling is what I'm looking at. Sure, we can, we can provide that. Okay, and then my next one would be um, what steps or hmm, I wanna say, uh, what do we do to retain our existing mobile and manufactured home parks? These are some places where our seniors and our low-income families can live. And I noticed other cities do make um, overlay zones so that they can protect them. Do we have anything like that? Yes, Bothell was one of the first uh, jurisdictions in Washington State that, that protected uh, mobile home parks with an overlay zone. Uh, so those are still in place. Uh, the, uh, uh, we're, we're not seeing uh, an urgent need, so it's not in this year's strategy to, uh, to re-examine that, but it is within the, the overall strategy. We recognize that uh, there have been some concerns raised that some of those parks are aging. In fact, they're all aging, and, <laughs> and there may be uh, a need to um, uh, rethink some of those strategies, find other ways to house uh, those people. Uh, going down the road, but uh, it's uh, it hasn't come up as a as an urgent need that needs to be addressed this year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then my last one would be um, my concern for people who are aging in place, and I see that there is certainly some options for them promote housing options and programs and services that enable seniors to continue living in their homes. So I'm just very much interested in what options are out there for them. Um, we've identified uh, working with uh, nonprofits uh, and perhaps providing some uh, support to nonprofit groups that uh, do uh, have programs for, to, to support uh, seniors that, uh, in aging in place. Uh, I think some of the housing preservation uh, strategies uh, would also uh, potentially do that, uh, giving seniors uh, uh, some resources for um, keeping their, their homes up. Um, they, they may right. be able to, to continue living in their home, but might not uh, be capable of maintaining it. Uh, right. um, so uh, those are some of the ones that come to, the, to my top. Right, yeah. and are there any exceptions like for property tax or exclusions for seniors, anything, that, or in utilities, anything that could be helpful for those kind of costs? Uh, I know the county assessor's office has uh, exceptions, uh, senior exemptions at certain income levels. Um, yeah, I know. It's pretty low. Yeah. <laughs> it's very low. I looked. <laughs> I don't know. Are there others, Martha, that... Well, one, I know one of the uh, things that the housing task force, the King County Regional Housing Task Force, is looking at is uh, working with the county to lower the... Or, I'm sorry, to raise that level of exemption. Uh, mm -hmm. For seniors, so they have a, right. a higher income level, they would still qualify because right now it is very low. That's mm -hmm. correct. The other, the other thing, maybe Arthur's going to talk about this, is ADUs and how those can help um, seniors in particular stay in their homes. So I'm going to put the unabashed um, plug in for Arch at this point. Um, ADUs is, which was just mentioned, um, aging in place. We're going through the same conversation with about seven other cities. A lot of people in your position care a lot about this topic lately. And there are several areas in which we are seeing pretty much universal um, concern. Aging in place and ADUs are two examples of those. 
Um, one of the things that can potentially happen through this unique partnership you, the city council's created a number of years ago is we are this year anticipating starting to look at ADUs from a much more comprehensive point of view. So it's not just about the residents thing saying I can't build my unit on this thing, but for the senior, okay, let's say that idea is out there. Where do they get the money to do that addition above the garage? Where is the financing that they might be able to afford on a, on a fixed income if they're retired in order to do that work? So we will look at not just, you know, we'll get all the cities together potentially to look into some ideas on where we might be able to, we tried this about 10 years ago to find the financing structure that might help households who are lower income to be able to do an ADU so they can stay in their home. Um, and then probably not this year necessarily, but like next year, the aging in place, you know, you've heard about property taxes, you've heard about that is we can get multiple cities together to brainstorm together and maybe develop either to help you on the regulatory side, but maybe work together to come up with some other types of tools that might be able to be applied across the region um, in order to address some of these issues like aging in place. So maybe there's a service program or a home share program, um, things along those ideas that might be able to be developed that might be hard to do on a single city level, but by cities getting together might be able to Thank you. All right. Anybody else have questions? No. no. Uh, we can move into comments. If that, uh, did, we could do a motion, and then have comments. Or you guys want to have comments and then a motion? Oh, they want comments and then a motion. All right. Let's do a round of comments. Who would like to go first? Councilor Zorns. Okay, so Dave, you answered some of my questions. I had a, so ex forgive me if I uh, am more disjointed than I usually am. Uh, one comment that I, just as an aside, uh, for my four sons put in jointly 15 years at working at Ranch Drive-In, working and paying their way through school at Cascadia and you've done both so I know exactly what you're talking about there. Um, my concern is about the amended attachments that we have here. They, they aren't minor. I'm coming from a perspective of living here in downtown. And I also live through the Siberia um, uh, design process. And I will tell you that people are, who live here, most people who live here live through that and they are still quite raw from uh, a lot of the changes that happened. Um, one thing when I was out doorbelling was someone said to me, get transition zones back and good luck with that. And I don't know if we'll ever have effective transition zones. Um, if you live on the cusp of uh, where uses are different, it doesn't feel like much like a dis, uh, transition zone. Um, and one piece of that, I'm just going to leap while we're on that, is density limits. And the part that we live in near an area where density limits were removed. And my comment, my question uh, to that uh, city council at the time was, can you explain to me the reason, the logic behind removing density limits? And they said, well, we don't want to look like the pines. And I, I, that, that logic still escapes me. So if we do move forward on removing density limits, I would love someone to explain that logic for me because I, I still don't get it. So even though we don't have density limits where I live, um, I'm really concerned about removing density limits where they, they exist in other parts of transition zones of Bothell. That has to be treaded very softly and very carefully. When I was on planning commission, I'm going to go back to the first uh, amendment. Um, we talked about offering uh, an extra floor for people who agreed to do affordable housing. And my comment to them at the time was, downtown is maxed out. We are maxed out topographically. Uh, what's zoned for? our um, little districts, our little sub areas in the sub area, uh, we are maxed out. And so personally, and that was, this was my comment during planning commission is, I don't wanna see an incentive where you get an extra floor put in. 
Now, in areas where we have not talked about updating the Siberia plan, like up in Canyon Park, where it's a broader valley floor, it's further away from residential homes, game on. Let's do that. But in an area that's already maxed out and people are wounded with uh, the previous changes, I think there's other ways to encourage some affordable housing. It's going to be hard. But adding another story, another uh, floor is, is not it. It would not have, I, I, I'm weighing in as I would not support that. But I don't speak for all of council. Um, I am very intrigued by ADUs. I would love to if planning, com planning Commission has room in their schedule to talk about that. I would love to see that cleaned up and encouraged. Um, also, you know, density limits, removing density limits, you know, have that conversation, but, but please come with more information on why that makes sense when it's right up against single family homes. Uh, let's see. And then on the undeclared fourth topic of, of uh, allowing residential to be put along that strip along 522, if that goes before Planning Commission and it goes through the public process and the neighbors who live up on that hill have an opportunity to weigh in, that makes a lot of sense to me as well. That uh, it sits right there on the highway um, buses can slide in and out. It, it just made a lot of sense to me, but it's not my judgment call. Um, I would appreciate, because the work is so comprehensive and so thorough and so well thought out, that our approval of strategies is separated and, we're voting, and we vote on that separately from, from what we do with the amendments and what we where we decide to go with that. And I think the only other thing is to make sure that we have uh, plenty of opportunity for the public to weigh in on this. And that's the sum total of my comments. All right, any other comments? Deputy Mayor? So um, I had forgotten to ask the question, but I guess I'll just make it a statement that I would be in favor of inclusionary housing and uh, added density limits um, on city-owned surplus properties um, if, when we, if when we go to sell those. Um, I think that makes sense. Th those are on, those are basically TOD opportunities and we have a little more say in, in what they uh, will become. Um, I I appreciate the vast amount of work that went into the housing strategy. I think it's very well thought out. Um, there's a lot there to unpack, um, so I'm not quite sure I get all of it. Um, and I agree in theory with the strategy. Um, I think the, the issues that I have are um, getting, to, you know, it's, it's all uh, the devil's in the detail. And I would um, hope that we, um, I, I think balance is really important. I think the downtown has, has really taken it in the chin. Uh, for a while now, we have pretty bad congestion. And so uh, as we look to make the balance between congestion and affordable housing, I think there's some nuance to it. Um, and we need to have careful consideration of um, the context in which we we make these changes. Um, I also, uh, I guess going through, I, I would like these code amendment, potential code amendments to be um, voted on separately um, from everything else. Um, I am currently not in favor of the, while in theory, I understand, um, the idea of putting affordable housing and, and higher limits on Beardsley. I think that will happen eventually, but I think it's, there are single family residents on that road that are ranches, and it just doesn't make sense to me to zone for four stories next to that. Um, number two, 
uh, I agree. We need to have transition zones. Um, there, the problem is those areas that we're talking about removing density limits from those are our affordable housing <laughs> right now, um, and I I don't think it I don't think it makes sense to endanger those affordable housing units um, by packing packing it in with no with no transition. Um, number three, I'm. I'm in favor of the carriage house. Um, I mean, I'd like to, you know, know the specifics, but I'm in. I am in favor of allowing the carriage house to ADUs. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and then the potential rezone of the commercial zone uh, downtown to SR522. Uh, I think, uh, as Councilmember Zorns mentioned, with a public process. Um, I could support this. Um, it's it's on the transit route. It's not adjacent, at least on level, with uh, single family residences, and so that um, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I'd like to to explore that. So um, those are my comments. Councilmember McNeil. Thank you. Um, I guess I'd start off by saying. Um, we have a lot of work to do, um, both here at home and across the region. Um, and I do appreciate the partnership with Arch and, and making sure that we're doing our part. Um, it's very interesting to hear the comments about the other cities and what they're doing. Um, so I appreciate being part of that process. Um, when it comes to um, ADUs, I'm encouraged um, by the conversation around ADUs. I think there's a little more to understand about the process um, when we heard tonight about uh, how long it takes, the different things you have to go through. What are the other alternatives? What are the other options? Um, is there um, homes that are built off-site, manufactured type homes that are brought, brought in? Uh, is it the permitting process that's taking the time? Just understanding the process, I think, it, uh, would be important. Um, carriage houses, uh, I'm all for that. I'm all for um, finding alternatives. Um, so that we can look after uh, our students, um, our younger generation, and our, future, our uh, senior generations as well. But I'm, I'm baffled by the amount of um, work that's gone into this and what we're going to have to do in the future. I'm, I'm just, I'm floored when it comes to affordable housing. Um, we go to meetings all the time and we hear about affordable housing and what it's going to take to uh, what, what was the last statistic that I heard that we're 200 and some odd thousand units behind where we need to be? Um, where, what do we need locally here um, within our community? How are we doing with our manufactured homes? We talk about, over, we have a protected overlay. Uh, that was one of the positive things I've had a, heard about in the community meetings here recently was that Bothell's one of the only cities that, that has protected its manufactured homes. Um, what does it look like in the, in the future for those manufactured homes? If they're run down, can we do stacked homes? I think there was a project in University Village, University District that had a, a, a affordable housing project that was put together was stacked, almost looked like um, containers. I'm not sure exactly what that project was, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I'm glad we're, we're, we're looking at it now and we're, we're taking the steps to ensure that we have affordable housing here in Bothell. Um, but I don't want to, I guess for, for me as a council member, I want to make sure the public understands that w this is not going to get solved overnight. Um, we're going to have to do a lot of work to ensure that we can create affordable housing here. And developers are not going to stop building homes for profit until we do something that allows them to build homes that are affordable. They're going to continue to be for profit. Partnerships with nonprofits, faith-based groups, I think, are, is awesome. Um, but I've been in the, industry, the construction industry for 27 years, um, and I'm just I'm blown away with what's going on with the prices of housing in our area right now. And I and I just you know I agree with the deputy mayor. We need to find you know transit-oriented development partnerships, um, possible with Sound Transit or Metro or whatever. But I, I don't know, but I, I think we're on the right track with what we're doing. But I'm um, I'm optimistic that we're going to uh, to make a dent, and I'm hopeful uh, that we will be able to take care of our seniors um, and our young students um, 
in perpetuity. So I'm just, I don't know what more I can say. I'm just, this is a, this is one that, that's got me baffled a little bit. And Arthur, I think you know what I'm talking about because um, it's a heavy lift and you just, you have to take it piece by piece and, and hopefully you can make the right, right dent in the, in the problem. So thank you. Councilmember McAuliffe. Thank you. So again, I think um, when we look at housing choices apply and we say that we need smaller housing types in single family zones, I also have kind of looked at the fact that there's a large percentage of families that just have two people in the household. It's not, I don't know why, um, that, but that's kind of the statistic I've read about. So I would like you to explore regulatory changes to support cottages, townhomes, multiplexes, rooming, boarding houses, and others. So that would be your B1 under regulatory flexibility, and or BA, sorry, yeah, B1, A. And then on this B, smaller housing types in multifamily and mixed-use zones. So that talks about micro-apartments near transit-oriented districts, and I'm really interested in that as well because our, co our colleges and universities would really be very, it would be helpful for them to be able to do that. And I think finally, and this is kind of one of the sky and the pie ones, so. <laughs> um, I think we have to explore how we're going to trade off um, when you build the apartments and you um, have multifamily homes, if there is some way to say, if we could develop a van or some kind of a service taking people from their neighborhoods to the transit areas, um, maybe they'd save on parking. And so that's kind of one of the things I want to look at in the future, is to say, how could we get, move people around the city better so that they don't have to have a car? It's walkable, it's livable, and there's some way for them to reach transit-oriented districts. Pie in the sky, maybe, but that's okay. <laughs> that's why we're here. Throw it out there. <clears throat> so I have just a couple of comments to add. I, I, I like what the, where the council's going with their comments and things. Um, but just a couple of things that I want to kind of put up in the forefront. And one of those is that we sold regional growth centers as a region as the place that we were going to accommodate growth. Um, and we did that with the mindset, a lot of, I mean, the majority of Bothell is R9600, R8400, you know, larger lots with a single family house on it. And as a community, we saw coming down the, coming down the tracks that we were going to need to accommodate a lot of people. And so we made a, we made a decision that we wanted to put people in downtown and we wanted to put them in Canyon Park. That became a regional growth center, so that had to mean something even though that did not come to fruition that there was housing put in there, but um, we're turning that corner now. But the, so I just kind of want to keep that in front of everybody that, that that was by design the intention of, because otherwise what we'd need to do is put a whole lot of people into the um, single family housing parts of the city. That also makes it more complicated for transportation, makes it more complicated for mass transit. Um, if you spread everybody around instead of trying to accommodate den uh, density in, in smaller sub areas. So I want to continue uh, with that and having the affordable housing in those areas makes sense to me. Um, I think where people get kind of confused is that, well, can the city just come in and say, you know what, if you go to develop that the way it is right now, we're going to require you to do affordable housing. Well, we can't, just correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we legally can do that. Um, I think we would have to do that before, like we were talking about, you can't upzone it and then say it's some of it needs to be affordable housing. You need to have the affordable housing requirement in place before you do the upzone. Otherwise, the city becomes exposed to liability and uh, we would lose. So uh, I just want to make sure everybody understands that, that, that that's why we can't just unilaterally make decisions up here to say, hey, we're just going to make affordable housing happen. Um, we actually need to do a thoughtful process of getting the getting the requirements in place first, and then start doing increased uh, up zones. And I think that's where people struggle because the last go around we made a whole bunch of accommodations to have growth in the downtown, and now we're talking about more growth. And the more growth is the affordable housing piece. And so I think we're all kind of str I'm struggling with that because some of these buildings that are going up. Yeah, I mean I grew up here, and it's just like wow, that's a very big building. Um, and, and we're not used to them yet, and we will. I can guarantee you someday, you know, 
20 years from now, it's not gonna be unusual at all to see a five-story building around here. People are gonna have to go somewhere. People want to live in this area. So we need to uh, uh, make places for them to live. Um, the other thing, and I've, I've talked to the, the mayors of the other cities about this, and I, I think I expressed this to Michael as well. I'm tired of talking about affordable housing. Like, if we start now, it's a five-year plan. Like, let's go. Let's start doing something now. Because we, um, and this is no dig on the city in, in general, but we haven't really done it. We don't have a lot of affordable housing. So why don't we turn that corner and start, at least start turning now? Because it's going to take years. Um, and we're, a recession is looming. You know, we could, we maybe have three, four years tops before the economies start to go down. So anything we start now, a five-year process, well, we're going to have to go through a recession probably before we'll really see stock of affordable housing become available. So I'd like to move on this stuff. Um, I understand there's concerns and there, there will be a public process for all this. Um, this is just a strategy. And the other thing that I wanted to point out is that I was pulled aside, and this was a totally impromptu, I didn't, didn't ask for it, but the former mayor of, of Bellevue um, talked to me about this affordable housing strategy that Bellevue just created uh, recently. And we stole their planner, who is now our, currently our planning director, um, that did this project. And so we are in excellent hands that with somebody at the helm, not, I'm sorry, I'm giving you a little ego stroke here, but. Uh, to do this for us and guide us through this. Bellevue just did this and now he is, he's here. And so um, I don't see why not to pull the trigger and start moving forward uh, with creating our own local strategy to uh, accommodate affordable housing. So that's all I have to add. Um, so I, I believe we are due for a motion. The staff have asked us to have two separate motions, one to be a uh, motion to approve the housing strategy update, and the other is a motion to approve the housing strategy implementation schedule. Is that correct, Mr. Boyd? Are you getting up there? To, okay. That's right. Do I uh, have a motion? One at a time. Go ahead. Uh, I would like to make a motion to, um, sorry, I gotta find it. <laughs> Uh, I can't get my computer up, so um, to make a motion to pass the housing strategy update. Second. Oh, there, beat me to it. Moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councilman Ragnew to uh, approve the housing strategy update. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, go ahead, place your vote. We're missing one vote. Passes unanimously. Is there a, mo a motion to approve the housing strategy implementation schedule? I Moved by Councilmember McAuliffe, seconded by Councilmember uh, McNeil. Is there any discussion on the motion? I'd like to propose an amending motion to remove one and two, C code amendments one and two. Second. It's moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councilmember Zorns to pass the, I'm, I'm doing a little ad hoc here, pass the housing strategy implementation schedule with items one and two removed. Is there any discussion on the motion? The maker of the motion, would you like to speak to your motion? Um, well, I. We heard some comments from the community about the um, the process um, that was long, long fought and uh, difficult to find compromise. And I, um, I, I just don't think it's the right time to uh, raise the height limit on Beardsley. And I, I think we need to respect transition zones um, in the downtown area because they're butting up against uh, single family, one story homes. And I, I think we need to respect our neighborhoods. That's part, that's also in the housing strategy is respecting neighborhood vitality. So those are my reasons. Any further discussion on the motion? Councilmember McAuliffe, you, would you want? Uh, I guess I'm just concerned as to taking it off. This is certainly, and, and let me try and be clear here. By keeping it on, 
it would come back to us for a vote. Is that correct? It doesn't mean that we're going forward with this. So I cannot support taking it off because I think we have work to do on it. And then when it comes forward as a, to a vote, we'll have that work done and we'll have the community involved and we'll have time to proceed. But taking it off is something that concerns me. Any further discussion on the motion or the uh, many motion? Thank you. Councilmember Zorns? I would just like to second what Deputy uh, Mayor Dewar said, is that there has been volumes and volumes of discussion on both items one and two historically here in Bothell. And I consider it a waste of staff time and planning commission time and our time to beat this dead horse when we have so many other issues that we have to deal with. So. Um, if the, if we had not had this discussion recently and the ink was dry on recent changes, then I'd say, yeah, maybe let's talk about it. But we have spent volumes of time and discussion on this, and I'm ready to put it on hold and deal with more immediate concerns. Any further discussion on the mini motion? So I'm not going to support the amending motion because I have full faith in the planning director to explore these items. I um, I, un I understand your guys' concern. I, I just think that we should keep everything on the table that the staff have recommended to fully investigate and understand. And so that's why I'm not going to support the motion. Any discussion? Go ahead. Oh, go ahead and place your vote. The amending motion fails uh, with uh, four in the negative, three in the affirmative. We're back to the underlying motion, which is to improve, uh, approve the implementation plan. Is there any discussion on the underlying motion? Or did we already do that? No, we didn't. Seeing none, you ready over there, C Clerk? You good? Okay. Go ahead and place your vote. Uh, passes unanimously. So that ends the public hearing. And now we are on to, I think this is where I moved AB 18 069, quarterly update. Uh, thank, thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation and thanks for coming in. Thank you. Um, Old business AB 18 069, quarterly update on progress towards council goals. The city manager, you have a presentation? I do. So this is the, actually the fifth quarter update for the 2017-2018 biennium, but the first quarter update for 2018. And the scorecard that is attached to the um, AB in your packet has been updated from our conversation that we had in January where you uh, refreshed and rebalanced and looked at your goals. Um, you didn't change fundamentally the goals all that much. Um, you incorporated some together, um, made some minor adjustments to some of the objectives, um, and we moved forward. And so I, that's reflected now in this scorecard for 2018. We removed some things that we accomplished in 2017, otherwise the scorecard gets too long and wordy. And so we're looking at um, accomplishments that we're doing and work that we're doing for 2018. So I have this in the on the agenda bill, but I just wanted to um, highlight a couple of things. So uh, the f affordable housing strategy, obviously something you just um, considered, uh, is coming forward. So that's um, we're making good progress on that. Um, the citywide uh, team building training and organizational development um, a, a training, a staff training needs assessment is being done by our new human resources director. We're very excited about that so we can better understand um, what our staff is looking for and where the needs are. Um, we're initially focusing on supervisory training. Um, we feel that there's a definite need for that in the organization. So I'm really happy that we have our new HR director on board leading us through that. Um, citywide technology, we've been doing some periodic updates, um, but we're implementing the utility building portion of the new financial software package, and we're also initiated work on the human resources payroll software system, um, really critical for, for the efficiencies of um, the organization. 
Under community connections, um, a new consulting team is in place um, for the audit on the tourism program and Explore Bothell. You've approved those contracts just recently. Um, we also have a public portal now through Laserfish. Um, again, this is about connecting to the community and giving them access to documents so they can more easily search and find things. Um, it's all part of the transparency and, and having our community be a part of the work that we're doing um, and the decisions that you're making as a council. Um, community health for those in need. We've made some good progress with our navigator program. We're um, working with um, Councilman um, Dembowski on looking for additional funding um, and other sources of funding. This has just been a highly successful program um, and so we're, we're eager to, to find additional funding for that. Um, economic development, we're very pleased that the consent decree um, is in place for the Bothell Service Center um, and the environmental work is beginning on Lot D and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and even though the AB says because it's for the first quarter which ended in March, um, the Main Street Enhancement Project is complete and as Councilmember McCall said we had a fabulous um, ribbon cutting on Saturday and so we're just delighted that that project is finished and we look forward to the businesses thriving on Main Street. Um, fiscal responsibility and stability, um, we've spent a lot of time working on the public safety um, levy and um, bond measure and, and bringing information to council to help you make a decision for June. Um, and we've begun work on our 2019-2020 uh, budget and we had a workshop just last Friday to, to start talking about your goals for that budget as well. Uh, Parks and Recreation, um, staff is working on purchasing those last five acres, so that's a, still a heavy lift for the Parks and Rec Department. Um, that'll be coming to you before the end of the year, which is our deadline to purchase that. And we're looking at possible purchasing strategies um, for the Shelton View Forest. The public safety strategy, the Fire Park Department strategic plan was fi finalized. Um, the Police Department personnel have um, participated in several events through the first quarter. They've been really active in our community. Um, and the safe streets and sidewalks, there was an annual um, progress report was done. We presented that before council um, and there's also a quarterly report um, attached to this as well for the safe streets and sidewalks. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's any areas. Um, we use the um, green, yellow and uh, red signals to show you what, where we're on track. Um, if you had any questions or any um, changes that you'd like to make, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for the city manager? Councilmember McCullough. Thank you. And on page seven and also page eight, you talk about the community resource day. Are we currently doing a community resource day? No, that's on hold at the moment. Oh, okay. I didn't see that right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then one other thing, and that is, um, you know, I'm, I really think it's important to do citywide team building um, training and for staff to really you know, work together as a team, um, I still think that City Council ought to have that same opportunity. I just received a proposal today um, that I've shared with the mayor for him to review and so I've been working on that. That's um, absolutely something that you've asked me to do and, and I'm committed to providing that for you. So I received a proposal um, from a highly recommended facilitator um, and so we're reviewing that and um, absolutely I'm working on that. My pleasure. Any other questions for the city manager or comments? Yeah. I appreciate the update. I like these. Um, I like the format. I hope everybody else does as well. It's just kind of a good snapshot of what we're, what our, what our goals are, and what you guys are doing to meet meet the goals that we've laid out. And I really appreciate it. The uh, the reports, quarterly reports. That's terrific. All right. Um, we have our pictures at eight o'clock. So, we do we have time for one more item? Is, uh, update is on the downtown here? city owned properties. Is, is, is the photographer here? Yeah. Oh, there she is. Oh, yeah. hi. There. You're ready to go. Oh, okay. Maybe we should take a break. Let's so go to break. Uh, we're going to be in break for 20 minutes because we have to do a photo shot or a group photo of the council. So we'll be back here at uh, 810. 812. Let's make it 812. <laughs> now let's make it 815. We'll be back at 815. Three chairs. 